this will look you like? Yeah, yeah. T- you're talking yeah. into your mic a little better. It's better. Uh, it's good. Better, better. Yeah, don't booga. turn away from it. And... Booga 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 booga. <clears throat> I think we're gonna have to cut that for sure. <laughs> okay, but we're we're rolling. All right. Well, we're back to another. Uh, what do we call this episode mm-hmm. of uh, Father Knows Something? And today we have my co-host is Morgan. Hello, hello. So she's got some wonderful stories that she has selected from uh, you guys that you have written in to uh, to request to view. So let's see what she uh, picked out for me. Okay, let's go. So today's theme is relating to parents and parenting and just how to address you know, certain problems that individuals have with their parents. And you've had plenty. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, we talked about a recent uh, parenting thing you did with my Jägermeister. That got brought up recently. Well, I was even referring to that. I I can still, you know, cause you uh, questions in my parenting or my (laughs) me me being whatever I do. Yeah, you have your moments for sure. All right, so let's um, dig in. Okay, so up first, Dear Jerry, my dad, 70 male, and I, 24 female, no longer have a great relationship. Growing up, my dad was a wonderful dad. He took me to horseback riding lessons, volleyball practice, school, to friends' houses, etc. He always showed he supported me and loved me. Every Wednesday, we would go on father-daughter date nights and have dinner and talk about everything. I had a very open relationship with him. When I went to college, I would come home once a month and we would have dinner. Now that I'm an adult, I've graduated college and been in the workforce for two years. My dad and I barely talk. Since I've graduated, he got a girlfriend and bought a big house for them to live in. I only live about 30 minutes from him, and I've only been invited over for dinner twice. We haven't gone on a date night, just me and him, without his girlfriend, since they've been together. I will mention that my dad suffers from macular degeneration, so he can no longer safely drive at night i.e. his girlfriend will drive him if he needs to go somewhere late. I have three older brothers that also have limited contact with them. I've asked my dad why we don't hang out more, and he says things like, you don't need me anymore, or blames it on him working all the time, as he is a workaholic. It's almost like he doesn't know how to be a dad to adult children. Do you think he believes I don't want to see him and I need to vocalize that's not true? How would you want your daughter to approach this situation? One of the dynamics that have truly changed her is is a woman. And I don't know what his relationship is with her and her relationship accepting the fact of uh, of his children. I don't what is we don't do we know the age difference? So she is twenty four. No, no, the the girlfriend. No. No age of the girlfriend is mentioned. Um and she does have three brothers, she said, but does not mention any of their ages. Right. She so there there there's there's four of them, and everyone's kind of being removed a little bit from the father. It sounds like that. But I would love to have known more about the the relationship that the father has with this woman, her age, to see if there's a competition, if there's insecurity on her side. You know, you've seen that I've gone out a lot with different. You know, over the years with you growing up. And as you did grow, as you were growing, I would have issues with some of the uh, security or insecurity of these women that I was with. And, and it wasn't always them. I'm sure it was me and my behavior interaction with them as well. So a lot of it is the chemistry that goes on with all of you. I do believe that uh, you need to have a sit down with them and, and ask them. And point blank saying what you're feeling. You know, not only does he change, but we got to also remember that you have changed as you have grown up. Mm-hmm. And you have your own mind. I'm, I mean, no, I, I could look at you and say that to you. You know, your need for me is changed how you need me today and how you uh, needed me back when you were 15 or 14 or 10. You know, you're a woman of 27 years old. You have your own mind. You do your own thing, and you know you do things and th- and think a lot of ways different than some of the things that I may think. And you'll say, you know, 
I don't, I, I, I'm glad to share some stuff with him, but you know, some of this, his stuff is a little goofy. And you'll look at me and see, think some of my thought processes are goofy today and some of my behaviors are goofy. So it's not that I really have changed. It's the way that some of the thoughts that you change and the way that you process those actions and it may, you know, things will frustrate you or I'm going to say, you know, OP. So I think there's looking two ways because there's two people that, that both of your dynamics have changed, certainly with the third dynamic of, of, the, of the girlfriend. And that is a major portion that I would love to know more. Yeah, and it sounds, you know, him saying things like, quote, you don't need me anymore, or blames it on him working all the time. It could be the fact that he does think that she really doesn't need him anymore. I, I, I don't know about that or that's just an excuse. A cop-out? I think it's a cop-out. Do you think him having health issues is kind of making him maybe feel inadequate or kind of playing into that? Um, I can only ref reflect on my own stuff. And I know that my memory isn't as good as it used to be. You know that my eyesight's not the, the best that I could. <laughs> I mean, I, I like to make my coffee in the morning. And Morgan, if I have a coffee ground on, on the counter, I might get in a little trouble here, guys. Um, you know, the, no. it, it's just, this is, I really do think that the, the problem mostly is the participants in this and not so much the age thing. I mean, we recognize that we get, I mean, I recognize clearly that I'm getting older. I recognize that, you know, I, I still think I can do all the things that I did when I was younger. You saw me run across the other, you know, the street the other night and, as you were watching me and laughing, I'm crossing the street. You saw me go fly flat on my face, tripping. Yeah, that wasn't good. <laughs> so, you know, got up and I sprung back. But you know, we just we we do things. We recognize that. I just think it's really a cop out again, like as, as that wonderful word that he doesn't know how to better better uh, maybe admit to himself that there's an issue with this dynamic of the girlfriend and and his kids mm -hmm. and. Need me? When I look at you, do I think you need me? Uh, I think that you have grown up to be amazing, beautiful, strong, able to fly on your own and get through life and make your own choices and decisions. Do you still want me as your father and you want that connection? You want to spend time together? Yeah, differently sometimes, but I, I don't think there's anything less that you like to have me in your life as much as you can and look at me and, you know, and, and participate. So I, I don't think that that, if he does think that, I think that's something that they'll, they'll both uh, just discover in a conversation. You know, I'm, I'm always one to have um, transparency when things are going wrong mm -hmm. and in a relationship that everyone has to really sit down and say, this is what's going on. I'm, I'm feeling this or I'm not feeling this. And can we, can we figure this out? Especially if it's important enough. Bring all those uh, wounds or scars or things to the surface that we can solve the problem. Yeah. Rem remedy the disconnect. Definitely. So I guess it wouldn't be OP because they're not posting, they're writing. So it'd be OW, original writer. So they write for their ideal outcome to see my dad more often and have him put in as much effort into seeing me as I do him. Do you think there's a good way to start this conversation? Like, would you offer, Kidnap hey, him. <laughs> like, I guess if he is bringing the girlfriend everywhere, how do you, you know, kind of broach the topic of let's just you and I get I, lunch? I, I, I would, I would just point and say, dad, I haven't spent time with you. I'm going to kidnap you tonight. And, you know, whatever the girlfriend's name is, GF, we'll just use GF for fun. Just, you know, I'm sure GF has something that, you know, a ladies night where she hangs out with her girlfriends. Can we do, um, next time that she has her GF night, can we, we're going to have our night. And I don't care if you have to work. This is important to me. Okay. Well, I think that's solid. Does that work for you? Yeah. On to the next you one. You want to have a, next time that you, uh, that I, my girlfriend has a GF night, do you want to have a night with your dad? Yeah, we can do that. We just had a, a date night. We watched uh, the new James Bond movie. We did. We did. It was great. Okay. So now I don't have to see you for three months. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so next one. Hi, I, female 24, recently just had a baby, and it's bringing up a lot of things that happened in my past. The problem is that it is now affecting how I'm thinking about my parents. I feel like in every big moment, for me, they weren't there, and they chose someone else over me. 
but it was so long ago. I don't feel like I can bring it up without starting something. And I don't want to disrupt people's lives over something that happened forever ago, but I'm still hurt by a lot of it. And I don't know how to get over it or get resolution about the feelings. I'll give you a couple of examples. There are two main issues that I keep going back to. One has to do with my sister deciding to date my ex-boyfriend. I didn't date him very long and it wasn't a very serious relationship, but my sister ended up lying to me about them dating and hid it from me. And it wasn't a huge issue, but it hurt my feelings. What I keep coming back to is that she and my mom just kept trying to get every little detail out of me about why I broke up with him and why I didn't want to date him anymore. I will admit, I didn't want anything to do with my sister. We had been super close previously at that point because I was hurt that she lied to me and I just wasn't interested in hanging out with her and her boyfriend, my ex-boyfriend. I'm a very private person, even with my own family. I just never felt like I could trust them, so I didn't cry about it. I didn't tell people the things that he did or how I felt manipulated by him. He was 18 and I was 16. He wasn't horrible, but he was ready for things I wasn't ready for. Marriage, serious dating, etc. I just didn't go into big detail about it. And since I wasn't crying, my mom took my sister's side and was made to feel like I was crazy for being a little uncomfortable or just not wanting to be around them. I was made to feel like I was the one who was causing all the issues and hurting my sister's feelings. The second issue happened even longer ago, and I won't go into great detail as I would like to respect my family's privacy. Basically, I found out about something awful my sister was doing, and I told the other person involved that they should tell her slash my parents. They did, and I was left to deal with the trauma of what I had found out. I don't know if my parents even knew that I was the reason it all came out but I got some pretty big hate from my siblings about it. My sister manipulated my younger siblings into hating me, and they would have meetings about how much they hated me. I don't think my other siblings even knew what she did. Meanwhile, my parents are nowhere to be found, and I just felt so alone and ostracized. I didn't ever go to them, though, and I know my parents tried to do the best that they could, but I didn't even know how to open up to them, and it's something that I struggle with to this day. They only went to the people who were directly in the situation and didn't think about how anyone else was affected. And to be honest, I'm not even sure if they gave the people who were in the situation the correct tools to heal and process what happened. So just to kind of like summarize, um, I think the two examples she gave about her experience was great. Um, And so the question, just recently had a baby and it's bringing up a lot of things that happened, trauma in my past. I'm still hurt by a lot of it and I don't know how to get over it. She, she obviously has a lot of wounds going on. And it's clear that the, the, the fact of the lie that her sister made is, is probably a bigger issue than her going out with the boyfriend. But I, obviously, we don't know what's in her head if she feels that her sister should never have gone out with the boyfriend in the first place. But the lie is the bigger thing. If, if, if you're done with somebody, and we've come across this with some of the people in some of your friendships that, you know, girl, you know, girls don't go out with, you know, girlfriends don't go out with, you know, your exes. That just, you know, if you break up with a guy and, you know, girlfriend says, oh, gee, I like him. I want to go out with him. It's not allowed in, within your group. It's, no, it's girl code. It's that's, girl code. That's just life code. You don't, you don't do that to your friends. And, and I've had relationships where friends of mine, we, that either I fixed them up with somebody else that I, I may have been with that wasn't the right relationship and I was totally cool with them being trying it to see if it was better for them than it was with me. Um, so, you know, different. everyone has their own uh, borders, what's acceptable and not acceptable with them. She obviously is having all kinds of issues with communicating within her siblings. She feels everyone is ganging up on her in a lot of ways. Well, it sounds like her sister was really a, a ringleader. I think she was truly bullied by her family. So, so let's, let's take that, let's, let's go down that road. In this circumstance where you're, where, where you're within a family that no one has respect to care for your feelings and, what, and, you, and you keep putting yourself back in this danger zone, don't you have to think for yourself, do I really belong in this danger zone or do, or do I need to remove myself from these people? I mean, how would a 10-year-old become independent? Well, she's not 10 years old anymore. Not anymore, but I mean this... Now, now, she, now she's an adult. Well, she's 24 years old. She has her own child. But... Trauma changes us. It changes our brains. Okay. 
So this was obviously a very traumatic childhood for her. But but the deal is, how does she deal with it today? Yes. And the, the, the biggest answer is that if if these people have not changed or grown up, and she had, and if she's had, and I, I guarantee you, I hope that she's had discussions with them to say, you know, where these problems are to try to resolve them. If there's no resolution, she she probably for her own health needs to remove herself from it, and make sure that when she raises her own children, that she makes sure that everyone uh, is open with one another, that that they don't see these. Um, stabbing in the backs going on, give them reason to have to work one against the other. I don't know if the parents have were, were manipulating these kids in some ways to compete with each other. I, 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 there are so many different you know reasons why people turn into this the, these environments. But today, her choice is to open up for discussion. If they can't re- resolve the discussion, she just needs to remove these people from her life because it's not healthy for her. Mm-hmm. I mean, she she can only deal with, you know, handle what's reality within her control. You can't control the other people. You can't make them, you know, really be sensitive to your needs. If if, if they're not going to behave that way, back away from them, and maybe they'll figure it out or define, you know, the rules of engagement of a relationship with her. What what her demands are today to have a relationship because now she's an adult, she can recognize what happened from before and what she's willing to accept today in her life. Yeah, I think setting boundaries with family and making sure, you know, that you're avoiding hurt the best you can is definitely, um, it's good. When asked if you have an ideal outcome, they do say a way to move past it without dragging it up again and to just try and learn from it without getting re-hurt by it so much. Mm -hmm. My first thought when I, you know, you hear some of this and, unresolved trauma, my first thought would be therapy. Mm-hmm. You know, pursue some individual therapy and really try to tackle these unresolved feelings that way. Mm-hmm. Um, especially if, you know, you don't want to bring it up and even confront them. Mm-hmm. What are your thoughts? No, I think therapy is great. If if she's able to do it and she's willing to do it. Um, you know, it, again, it's, therapy is only going to involve her feelings and how she deals with it. It gives her the power to make her choices, which she can function with and, and, those, and, and maybe how to interact with them better. But if, they're, if these people are not going to be able to uh, put themselves in her presence and she is not going to be triggered by it and she's going to continue to be triggered by it, and she, even with therapy or, or any other form of, of assistance, then she has to cut them out of it. It's not going to work. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think too, just recognizing that she's not her parents as well, like breaking that generational well, if trauma. Well, if she's worried about how to raise her own child. It sounds like that. It sounds like the baby is kind of bringing up some unresolved feelings. Then, you know, take the experience that, that look, I grew up in a home where somebody yelled all the time consistently. Every day of... I can't remember a day my father didn't yell. And I, I wanted to make sure that in our home that that was not a lifestyle that we had, that we were yelling and screaming across the house. Sometimes you'll go in the room and you'll try to yell at me to do something, and I'll walk in and I said, you know, can you talk to me because I'm right here? <laughs> can you, can you get? Because it triggers me. So I, I, I try to set the standard that it doesn't work for me. And for the most part, we don't yell here. We really do talk. I've never, we've never gotten a yelling fight with one another. We've never gotten to blows where you and I have had an out and out right fight. I've never had a fight with you. I've never got to, to so angry with you. I know you get frustrated with some of my behavior and I can certainly, and I sit back and I talk to you about it, but you and I have the ability of having communication. Yeah. I mean, I have thrown a piece of watermelon at you before. But we do communicate. For the most part. Okay. So... If, if she can't communicate with her family and she can't get past that, and that's what the, maybe she, if it is assistance with uh, some counseling to learn how to, do, to get the tools to be able to work through those, you know, those mazes of, of personalities, whatever their, you know, everyone else's triggers are, that's good to have for life because everyone in life is going to have a different way of, of communicating and sometimes not communicating 
on a, um, on a pathway that we talk in and they have their triggers and their behaviors. So it's always good to have those tools just in life to how to, how to talk with people. It makes mm-hmm. her a better person. And, you know, but, but it did sound like in the beginning when I was hearing this, that she had a lot of issues with, the, with, with years of all this because she was felt that she was being ganged up by them. And she... Yeah, I would say it's, you know, when I read it, I'm, I think I interpret a lot of it that she felt her parents weren't really ever meeting her needs in the way that parents are supposed to look out for their child. And, and, that, and by the way, that's the way that she sees it. Mm-hmm. They may have been the greatest parents in the world. We don't know. Yeah. But that's the way she sees it. Which is all that matters. And that's all that matters is correct. Because mm-hmm. if you said this to her parents, they would say, she's out of her mind. Yeah, no, I she, mean... We were the best parents in the world. We loved her. I don't know where she came up with this. I don't know where that wire got got put into play. I've been there with my own trauma, and I think, you know, something that is so impactful for you, other people look at it like, oh, it's just another day. Mm -hmm. It doesn't stand out in their mind. So, Mm -hmm. yeah, our our traumas and things we go through is very subjective. You know, this this is what's in her mind. So if she needs assistance to try to get through this, maybe it's a great way that she'll sit down with someone on a professional level and say, hey, let's look at you first. And how you process this information, and can you use this to get through it? Mm-hmm. But if if it really is a consistent thing that's not going to work, and it's specific to her, to that family and that dynamic, and she needs to for her own sanity to get away from it, then she probably needs to, you know, put that boundary up. Definitely, boundaries are boundaries are good. Love a good boundary. Okay, on to the next one. Okay. I, 21 female, am just looking for advice on the best way to tell my stepdad that he won't be walking me down the aisle on my wedding day. My biological dad died when I was nine, and my mom remarried two years later. My stepdad is a really nice guy, but we never bonded in a way that I see him as my dad. I think he always was trying to not cross boundaries, since he knew my real dad had died. So in turn, he was always just there, but not really a father figure to me. I love him, and we get along, but there's not really a bond there. I will be getting engaged in the next year, and my stepfather has casually mentioned how happy he'll be to walk me down the aisle. I don't really believe in this tradition anyway. I'm not anyone's to give away. So even if my real father was here, he wouldn't be walking me down the aisle either. How do I approach this subject without hurting his feelings? I know he loves me and will take it personally, but it's not personal. Well, I have a couple thoughts. Sometimes it's not giving you away. It's how you want to view this. If there's someone specifically that you feel that is a person that you can't imagine not to be the person to give you away, that would be one conversation. But you have now made it very clear, no one is to give you away (laughs) because you're not anyone's to give away. However, there is someone that has been a part of your life and this is maybe a view you may want to look at, that he has been a part of your life walking through life with you. And this might be a path that he wants to walk this path to where you go into your next part of your life. And it's how you guys want to interpret it and maybe display it. If you just really don't want him to have anyone walk you down the aisle and you want to be go single, then do it. I mean, that's it's your day. It's your day. Yeah. <laughs> Make your own rules. If if it's just the term giving you away, maybe it's a conversation of getting rid of that thought and being a little more imaginative and, and say, here's here's my mom. My mom is, has a certain part in this wedding. And my stepdad, who's been a part of my life since I was what, two, is that when? 11. Or 11. That. He walked, he walked a certain part of my life, and this man is not going to walk another part of my life. I don't think it's that, though, because based on the writing, it sounds like she doesn't want anyone to walk her way. Right. And even if she did want someone, it wouldn't be him because, she, you know, she says, we don't even have a bond. We're not close. Well, she said that, that he was there, you know, going through her life. and Yeah, but... I mean, it, it, it's not a father bond, but he certainly was a person that was in, his, in her life and part of her who loves her very, appeared to, it, I saw there was some type of feeling. It was almost like, 
I didn't want to get in Matthew's, my, my son Matthew's face, you know, as because he already had established there was men figure in his life or his dad. And I had to be very in the shadows for a little, not that I wasn't there, but I was in the shadows and I was present, but I didn't push myself on him. Which is, it does sound like that's what he did, but she still feels, I love him and we get along and we get along, but there's not really a bond there. Okay. So how does she tell him? She just, she, she has to be direct and straight. So he, they're all on the same claim that I'm not going to, I really don't feel that I want anyone to walk me down the aisle. Mm-hmm. I feel very independent. You know, I want to make a different statement that I'm not being given away, but I'm going into my next, the next portion of my life with, with a man I'm going to share my life with. Not that I'm his to control or anything like that. She's a very proud, independent woman. And obviously the man that she is marrying recognizes this, that they are two people of equal placement in, in this relationship that they are going to hold hands and be with each other to support each other as, as friends and, and, and lovers and spouse to go through life hand in hand. Yeah. But not that one person is being owned or controlled by the other. Mm-hmm. And I think that I think that, that representation, this guy will understand mm-hmm. if she presents it that way. I think that, that's a responsible way of doing it where he doesn't feel like, well, gee, you know, I'm being ousted from walking her down the aisle. It's more that she's making a different statement. And she may find a different place for him in the wedding. She may just say, I'm really glad that you'll be in the front row row standing with mom. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, she's got to, you know, figure that part out herself, you know, what her wedding will be. But she is certainly can easily open the dialogue by just saying, I clearly don't want to send that statement. Yeah. It's interesting, you know, how people, everyone interprets things differently too, because I think a lot of, you know, it was very traditional, like mm-hmm. a dad, father is giving his daughter away. It's his property transferring, you know, hands. But I think too, if you look at it in other ways, kind of like you mentioned, where it's more of an honor, like it's almost like in my, in my head at why, least. Why, you're going you're, you're gonna to get married one day, I hope, I yeah. imagine. Yeah. Okay. And... It's not about me walking you down the aisle. It, would I love to walk you down the aisle? I'm here to walk you down the aisle. Am I here to take your veil and peel it back? Sure. If if I'm there just to watch you get married, I'll get just as much pleasure of just being there and doing one task or another task or one on it. I've had the honor of, of raising you. I have the honor of saying at night right now, I love you. And hearing you say, I love you back. The one circumstance of that one afternoon, am I going to be crushed if you say, Dad, I have a different direction for my wedding? Is it going to change who I am and my feelings for you? Not in the least. No, no, no. I was just going to say, which literally almost had me crying over here, but I just was going to say, I think, you know, it all is dependent on how you look at it. If you want to look at it, like it's giving, someone's giving you away, then that's how you're going to look at it. But I, in my personal head, I'm like, I think it's just a way also to recognize the people in your life that have gotten you to that point and give thanks. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it is, it, but it's, it's to each their there's, own. There, look, you have, you have two fathers. You have a father that was your biological father who's certainly been in your life, whatever level that might be. And then you have me who has been your dad who has raised you, uh, from the moment of cradling you, changing your diapers, uh, you know, trying to trying to steer you in right direction sometimes, laying some certain expectations down, and and I had ex- expectations. I w- one of my biggest ones is that you would be able to make choices and decisions on your own, and no one's going to tell you what to do, but you could be that you're able to fly, and that was my job as your dad, riding the train of your wedding. To be on your dress or sitting, you know, on the train of your dress, <laughs> holding your hand, sitting in a pew, or just watching you grow and experience this, th- these feelings. That's what a dad wants. It doesn't mean he has to be in the wedding. So I can guarantee, I, I, I can't speak for him. I can speak that if you were her and I was him and you came to me and you said, Dad, 
We're not going to have that issue, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> um, but but if what did- if he doesn't take it well? How Any tips for how to f- patch that relationship up and really get it across that it's, it's not personal? It's- I think there's just a conversation. I think in the conversation when you sit down with him and maybe he could... You, it, it, it may be, does he, she may have certain uh, defined re- thoughts for her mom. If it's the two of them, maybe she can sit down with them and say, this is kind of my idea of what I want for the wedding. And this is where I want it to flow. And it, this is n- no impact or insults on you, but I don't wish to do that. Mm-hmm. And you'll see what happens. It's, you have to react. Yep. But you also have to stand your ground and your belief because... It is your wedding. Yeah. It's your day and you get to do what you want. This is true. I think a lot of people have these issues on their weddings. Of, of Oh, yeah. And some people just say, you know, sometimes I want to lope. <laughs> yeah. But I, I think there, it's a beautiful day and you should, you've dreamt about it. I'm sure, I'm, I'm told, I don't know, I, I, I was not one of these people that dreamt about my a wedding that, you know, every day of my life and what I would do. But I've always been kind of a, if I ever did get married, I would come up with a plan that would be important to me. And mm-hmm. I'm sure that she's got what will be important to her. Yeah, that's the way you got to do it. I, um, I, as you mentioned, I do have two dads and I took my biological dad out for dinner once and had a serious boyfriend at the time. We weren't engaged yet, but you know, it was at that point you talk about a future and whatever. Mm-hmm. And he said, who would you have walk you down the aisle? And I said, well, you know, I'd like for you and Jerry both to. And he goes, no, I would never. Don't even bother inviting me to the wedding. So, you know, she could have a reaction like that. And it's tough. It's something you just got to, like you said, handle it as it comes. And so... It's weddings are tricky. Family dynamics, as you know, we see, and is that, and, tricky. And, and, and maybe some some fathers or stepfathers are not as secure. I would agree with that. As I am with with our with what our relationship is, and deal with things on a different level. So I maybe maybe yeah, I have to be more cons- in. The reality that not everybody is is I like emotionally use, mature. I would use the word mature. That you know that you know don't sweat the, this stuff. The most important thing in our life is our children, their health, and watching them go through the next stage. And look, I I, I would be tickled pink and excited to be to to watch you in any way, shape, or form. And it's not the moment you say I do. It's post the moment you say I do for the years of growth, what's going to happen with you. And if you have children and you're blessed with all the other things. Not well, everyone can think that way. This guy has, is more, it's more important to him, especially if they've been, in, if she's been around for, it's now 10 years. She, she was six, she was 11 and she's 24 now. 21 now. 21 now. So yes, it's 10 years. Not the many, not okay. the many years. So, and if he's planning on being around for, for, for years and decades to come, he wants to see you develop. This is not going to be the make or break if he's going to be around or care that, that you're, at least if it was me. Yeah. And if it is, you know, a make or break for him and he's really hurt, then that's, you know, more on I, him than, than you. Than and you. I, I, and like I said, I, we, let's, give him, let's give him the benefit of the doubt if you have a discussion with him that he will... And if you present it, you know, with maturity, and you know, keep your focus on on where the ball's going on this and what the reasoning is, I think it will work out. Mm-hmm. Okay, solid. Moving along. Okay. Hi, Jerry. My husband and I are currently pregnant with our first baby girl. We are around six to eight weeks to her arrival and can't decide on a name. Do you have any tips on how to pick a name? Or any suggestions? Ouija board. No, no. <laughs> oh, <I'm kidding. laughs> we're not opening that can of worms. Take twenty-four letters. Put a, the twenty-four, or twenty-six letters in the alphabet. Twenty-six. Twenty-six <laughs> letters. Put a, put them in a Yahtzee. Put them in a Yahtzee thing and toss them out. Play a game of Scrabble. Do I have a way of picking a name? Think of circumstances that things that made. 
I might even go as far as thinking of, of, a, of a wonderful thing between the two of you, maybe a word or, or something, and find a foreign word uh, that means that and see what that word might be. There's a lot of different ways. There might be a, uh, depending on your religion, there's certain things that if you find that uh, in the religion that you're supposed to follow a parent or uh, a, someone that has passed away, you take the first letter of their name and you can kind of, wander from there if it's at a w start with wanda mm -hmm. <laughs> if it's you know it's an m you, you just start with the first letter then work to other names that might come with it but sometimes a circumstance a place different things you know help you fit what your feelings are and who, what that soul will be Maybe you should just wait till the, per the baby's born and then have some options and then and, wait yeah. and then when you look at that child and something happens, all of a sudden, boom, there's the name that, that really, you know, fits that soul. It I will know. come to you. It will happen. I what an exciting. I know, so exciting. I remember, you know, we you know, we we, we went through you know thousands of names. Your mom had every book in the world going through names for you. And I and, and we'd go, Yeah, I like that name. That that fits. But it really didn't fit till after you were born. And then all of a sudden, boom, it fits. Yeah, I know. I, I you, you hear the other options she had for me. I think like Danielle was one of them or something. And I was like, oh my God, I'm not a Danielle. No offense to the Danielles out there, but it just... Well, Quasimodo was one of them. Yeah, I could see that. I could <laughs> see that one. But it is it is interesting. I was going to call you Qua. No. Oh, God. <laughs> There's a book uh, called Get Outliers it. by Malcolm Gladwell, I believe mm -hmm. is the author. And you know he speaks about the power of names and how... Names can really shape a human and mm -hmm. determine even their success in life. Mm -hmm. And he uses an example where he's like, you know, Elizabeth could be a CEO of a company, mm -hmm. but are you going to see Misty as a CEO? You know, when you hear the name Misty, what it like, he gives examples like that. Mm -hmm. So names are, names are a powerful thing. Great thing to bear in mind. I love the idea of going through certain spiritual experiences and then trying to find a name in a certain, maybe in a certain uh, unique language that it would meet. And all of a sudden you got something very unique and, mm -hmm. and beautiful. It's, you know, everyone has their own way of doing things. Yeah. I've got a good list going. If you uh, email me, I'll, I'll forward it to you. Okay. Okay. Last one, I believe. Oh, nope. We got two more. I like that one. Yeah, that was fun. It brings back memories. <laughs> See, guys, you never, you never lose the feeling and the love. And when you think about those thoughts of, of what happened, you know, 28 years ago and 27 years ago, it's, you know, until that, when that point really came. But, uh, and then I look at her and it's, it's, all, it's all warm <laughs> and fuzzy. All right, uh, come on, get me, out of, get me out of this mess. Okay, so up next. Dear Jerry, my mom tries to get involved in my brother and I's relationship. I, 30 female, and my brother, 32 male, haven't really gotten along for over 10 plus years. He says he's scared of me. I'm very direct. I don't like pretending. And I say what I think. And I know some don't like it. Issue is my mom keeps saying she wants us to be friends and for my brother to be involved in my son's life. I gave birth six days ago. I haven't spoken to my brother in three months. Not one word. I know me and my brother not speaking will cause issues with my family events, but I just want peace and for my mom to leave us to be and not interfere. I feel so stressed about it. Help. I have a really good question. Mm -hmm. What have you done to this to your older brother to make him so feared of you? Men I, are weak sometimes. I don't know if you have literally taken a whip to him and beat him. <laughs> I would imagine not. And I would say no. Nope. Probably not. Obviously, he must feel he makes you explode, that he triggers you. And I'm, I'm going to assume that for this first part of the conversation. And then I'm going to take another approach because I don't know if that this is what it is, that, that you don't trigger him and that you don't, or he doesn't trigger you. Whatever, whatever it is, I think you have to really sit down with your brother and see, again, what, have one of these, these conversations and tell him this is, you know, if, if he does trigger you, Tell him what goes on and, and what the trigger is and see if he can remove that from his, 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 uh, his, 
his behaviors. I mean, I, I just keep going back to it as I'm thinking. But what if she's okay with the relationship the way it is? It sounds like her mom is the one that really is trying to push these two well, together. Well, there's no doubt that your mom has to stay. You have to have a conversation with your mom. Stay out of your way. Mm -hmm. there, there's no doubt. I mean, I, I do know there's mo there's moms out there that can be and dads that can be very controlling and manipulative to their kids. And the first thing that that at this point in time, now that you're adults and you're out having your own children. They got to stay out of your way. So you have to really, yeah. you have to define again those boundaries, and say, "Hey, mom, Bob and I are gonna, we're gonna figure this out." Yeah. The more that you mix in with Bob and I, it's just adding more fuel to the fire. So why don't you just sit back and if you see something, just you know, just try to bite your tongue and see if we can work it out. I'm gonna recognize there's an issue, and I and, and I'll say, I promise you, I'm gonna look, you know pay more attention to my relationship with Bob and see if I can figure out what's going on with us, if it's something abnormal or normal, and I'll talk to Bob. But if you get involved, it's just going to make it worse. Mm -hmm. So I would definitely, and that just goes on with, with moms and the interaction that they have with their kids, period, trying to take control of their lives. Like they, it's time we let our kids do their own, fly on their own. And sometimes they're going to they're gonna hit a tree. we got to sit back and just let them... Get get back up on you know get back on that perch and go. We, if you don't, it you'll try to control them, their relationship, the other person in their life, their kids. It's just not a healthy thing. They got to grow and they got to be their own people. And I can, I probably went away from you know the first problem, <laughs> but it really is it, it it's the heart of a lot of these problems. Mm -hmm. And I see so many you know families, and I see so many of my friends that have kids that. You know, on one side or the other side, this is very apparent. And you just kind of say, God, I wish this, these people would back up. But you can't say anything because it's not my business. So I don't mix in with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, you know, boundaries has been a kind of a common theme in this today. And yeah, so it it's Boundaries and setting boundaries is really, really hard. And, you know, it sounds like maybe even if she has, it sounds like she has kind of tried to set boundaries with her mom, like mm -hmm. saying, don't interfere and maybe her mom just isn't getting the message, so like you have to take it to the next step. And so let's talk about the next step. If you're with a parent, and the parent keeps sticking their their toes in the water, and you love your parents, you don't want to drive them away, mm -hmm. but you really want to keep their toes out of the water. How do you do it? It's an interesting question. Should we should we go down this path? What have you done that you have found works? Um, I try to talk to um, the parent. If it, if it concerns me and it's in my business, uh, I try to talk to the parent to say, you got to let them grow. You got to let them do their own thing. Please, you know, you got enough of your, own, of your own life issues to deal with. You know, we have our own things. Let's, you know, let's watch and see what they do. You have to let watch and let them see what they do. And if mom, you know, in this I'm not, situation. I'm not, I, 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 I prefer not to bring, you know, you know, mom has a way that she likes no it. no no no. and cut, if cut the mom that. in this situation <laughs> doesn't God. no not my mom and if the mom cut, in this situation by the way, cut all that out <laughs> cut. and if the mom in this situation doesn't cut it out what is the next step no contact because a lot of experts well, push let's just say that she that. let's say that she really loves her mom and her mom is not listening you know, this is going to be the accountability. I know that in, in my own family that happened with one of my siblings and, and her son. And let me tell you, he is very defined in his boundaries. And she gets in trouble. And she knows that he'll say, I, I'm not coming around for a while. And he loves her very much. Mm -hmm. But there is boundaries. And maybe that's what it is. And, and that's how that parent learns that, this is their life, and she gets to watch it, but she doesn't get to control it. Yeah, that's the key word, control. And I was glad I was able to bring that, that thought into my brain and bring it because I, 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 it worked. Yeah, no, that's the perfect example. And I think that is you know, the key point of setting boundaries. It's you state what you have an issue with, and then you state the consequence. Mm -hmm. If you continue to intervene and mm -hmm. try to push me and my brother together, I'm not going to be able to talk to you. 
I'm going to have to remove myself and go no contact or low contact or whatever your step is. It, 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 it's interesting. It, it, he, you need the, the, the writer, you need to take the power. Mm-hmm. There's no doubt. Take the power and I think it will make the change. Yeah. And, but, keep, but, but keep the power with, dig, I, I love that word. I keep using the word dignity. But keep it with, with firmness and conviction and with love. Mm-hmm. That's how you'll succeed with it because your, your mom in this case will recognize the fact that this is a boundary and it's growth. And like I, I, I said last week or a couple weeks ago, you help me grow. <laughs> you do. Yeah. And it's important that we as parents grow as well. And especially as our children grow, because it's 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 a process that we all do until mm-hmm. the day until the day that we go to the other side. Okay. Ooh, ended on a heavy, but one last one. Are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Uh so they go, Hi Jerry and Hi. And Morgan. Hi. Love your podcast. Getting into it. I'm a stay-at-home mom. My husband is military. I have a bachelor's degree and I'm that I'm not using. And I'm currently working on a certificate in a different field. So our toddler, formerly very ill, while I'm home now, can attend daycare while I work. My husband has been gone on and off our entire relationship. When he's home, he's angry and frustrated with the kids just for being kids. He doesn't contribute to the family at all outside of finances. And even with that, he's terrible with money and continually puts us in dire financial situations. He makes good money. He has just become very selfish and doesn't pay attention to the needs of the kids. He says he loves us and has some good days, but all in all, I feel like a single mom. I'm big on making things work, but I don't see our situation changing as he refuses to seek professional help. Our oldest son has started ignoring him because he only has negative things to say when he is around. He's leaving for another deployment soon and will be gone for a year. I feel like I have no partner, whether he is home or not, and no support system. I struggle with whether or not to leave. My mom left my dad for similar reasons, and it was very hard for her financially. I've seen this play out in her life, and I don't want either of these options for myself anymore. What should I do? Wow. Well... He's clueless to what it is to be a family to be of a family man because he's never experienced these kids growing. If if if, if somebody goes into a relationship with, with with if party A goes in a relationship with party B, party B has children, party A's never had kids, they have no clue what kids are. Mm-hmm. You're clueless to it. I've experienced this. This guy did all the motions. He got married, he had kids but he has not had to engage in a family unit where he sees where, you know, a child. And the sad thing, he's missed all this. He's missed this wonderful experience of these children, you know, going through diapers, coming out, saying daddy, being a part of it on a daily basis. He might have experienced it. Hey, by the way, kids, this is your dad. Look, I have two grandchildren back in Minnesota. I, I've seen one of them twice, and I've seen the other one zero yet. COVID, COVID's been a major player, and it's real. It's, it's a real circumstance. And I haven't had the, the ability to, 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 to see my granddaughter. And, my, and she said, Grandpa Jerry, I thought he was dead. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was pretty bad. And this is a hard thing to, to talk about, you know, as I'm as I'm here, to, you know, try to give people advice and certain you know, thoughts, but it is it, it is a a real issue that we have to deal with, mm-hmm. and that I'm trying to deal with more, you know, appropriately as they are getting that age. Yes, I had a wonderful time with my kids that I was, you know, in the same uh, home in the same town in the same city as they were growing up until I did have to move away at one point in time, but you know, this guy has. Is, is clueless to what it is to be a part of a family. And and she is a single parent. Mm-hmm. And that's the reality of it. I, I, I can't tell you what's going on in this father's mind other than the fact that, you know, she has to really ask him, what does he see? What does he want? I mean, I, I understand he's playing, he's doing the financial 
position, which reality, that's just reality of life at this point in time, and the courts will do that. But what does he want? Does he want a, does he want a marriage? Is there a possibility they can figure out how to have a marriage if he's going to be active in the service? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, deployments, you know, how, how long are you deployed for? Four years and then you're, you know, is it two year and two year? And this part is over and you can now get a desk job if he's going to be a career guy. Does, does she move to a place where they can, you know, see, him, see each other, you know, more on a regular basis? Going away for a year, he's on a submarine? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, a year stint deployed is that's a long time. I I I mean, I give military families and, you know, the women um typically their women that stay home with the kids while their partners deployed is is very challenging and you I don't know think guys they're allowed that do to it take too. their kids on the subs. I don't think no, that works no. that way. No, no. So very 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 challenging situation for sure. Um do you think there's I guess a way to encourage him to maybe be more of a parent or Maybe understand his kids a little more when he is home. Um, oh God! I mean, I mean, I, I, I certainly know we have tools today that we can certainly uh, have more visual contact with. If it's Zoom, and I don't know if you can do that. If you, and when I when I hear the word deployed, and out and out of reach, I look at the fact that he maybe he could be on a submarine. Let's just pretend that he's on a submarine that you can't get to them, but they do surface. And when they surfaced, is he, you know, when they when they come up for to, to you know for a, a period of time, are they allowed to go on to Zoom and visit with their kids and connect and watch their kids grow? Because it's that connection. These kids don't even know who their dad is in reality. Daddy's home. That's it. And then he, and Daddy doesn't deal with the patients. It's like you know we are with you know some of the kids that we have in our building that their behaviors are enough to make you nuts, and. Do you think family therapy would be a I good think, option? I definitely think that they're all of the above. Mm-hmm. Every bit, every anything that they, that these people can do, because their relationship. I don't know how their relationship could even survive this, but I, I, I've, I can only, You and I can't imagine having relationships with with a partner that we see once a year, twice a year. No, it, it wouldn't. It would not work for me personally. And there are people in the service that sacrificed their lives for this relationship. Yeah. And I don't know what she bought in for and, and what she was told if she knew this is what their life was going to be. And she took it brave. You know, but a, a, a marriage or a life is with two people, sharing, growing, being a part of it. And maybe that she'll have to make this determination or he'll have to say, you know something? This means enough to me that I have to make some changes in, 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 my, in my life and what I'm doing for my living and find something different. I, it's obviously not working. This, yeah. This is, this is not working. No, and I think her, her quote, she says, I feel like I have no partner, whether he is home or not, and no support system. I struggle with whether or not to leave. Which well, it's, what, what keeps her there? That is one great question, um, and I think something you said I would like to point out. She is a single parent, regardless. Mm-hmm. So whether or not you stay with this, you know, this person, you're acting as a single parent as it is. So what? What are you scared of? Mm-hmm. You're, you know, you're already doing this on your own. You are a single parent. But the the the, the bad part of her being the single parent is when he's coming home. He doesn't have the patience for the kids. He doesn't know how to relate. So now he's going to cause. He could possibly cause more harm to to who they are because he's he he's coming out of the military he's he's coming out of you know very rigid conforming you know lines mm-hmm. and kids as much as we like to believe that they are rigid and conforming no they're the exact opposite <laughs> doesn't work that way so what are you going to do you have to have some patience that doesn't mean that you don't have def- defining boundaries for your kids and expectations but you have to have a you know we learn you know, that the parent handbook gets tossed out the window. I know they give it to you at the hospital, but it's it's tossed out the window as soon as you, you engage and you start seeing how it really does work, the dynamic within your home with, with some practices but and behaviors. But like with you, uh, I, I'll never forget we had the OL clause. 
And I, so it was, if you, if you do this here, this is, this is my expectation. Kids are fine though. It's the husband. That's the problem. Right. But he doesn't understand any of this. No. So, you know, it's, it's really, it's and coming and by to the that way, decision. They're not fine for him. They're not conforming to what his expectation. So he's getting irritated and he's trying to, you know, come in as, as the man of the house, this, this and this is a vision. I'm not sure this is what it is, but this is what I'm imagining. Mm-hmm. And it's not working for anybody. And it's tough. So she definitely has to take, take. you know, she is the household leader, believe it or not. She is the leader of the roost. Oh, for sure. So she really has to define with him what his position really wants to be in, the, in this family. Yeah, when asked if she has an ideal outcome, my ideal outcome would be peace and security in my home for my children and for myself. Do I do do you hear anything about the love of the family unit? You know I I didn't hear that in there. I heard peace and security. Mm-hmm. Which she financial she, security is not everything. I well, think. she 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 couldn't have peace and security because he is the father. He'll have to give, I'm sure, child support. Child support, and if and that will give her the security at least of 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 the home mm-hmm. while he's providing. But if and if she goes out and works a little bit when they get a little older, or she has some other assistance, she can have that home. But she will be a single parent if she finds somebody else to share her life with that wants to share her children. Look, I. I I know firsthand there are people out there that would want to share life and share children. One thousand percent. And you're not locked in to a relationship where there's no love, there's no um, partnership, there's the dreams of being with one another and sharing with one another and having your and raising your children together. He has to get his priorities um, straight on what he what he wants, or at least you both have to get get the same priority. If, if it's him being a career guy, then you guys have to figure out how he can be the career Army, Navy, Marine, Air Force, but you guys can do it together and, and have a life together. Very tough situation, I think. Hopefully she can come to terms with whatever decision she wants to make and have that peace. Again, it's a, it seems like the, the one theme in, all, in every one of our, our conversations is have the conversation. Mm-hmm. The conversation might be different for everyone, but there's one word that is synonymous with every one of these uh, write-ins, and from the word go, it's a conversation. And you have to be trans- transparent, honest, and true to yourself, as well as true to your partner you're having the conversation with, that you guys can come to a remedy. And these conversations have got to be really, really open, honest, and without any, uh, with, with, when I say hostility, they have to be done with, with rules of engagement of, of what can be said and how these, these conversations are conducted. Because they, if, if they blow up and explode because you're starting to put blame, everyone gets defensive, everyone gets hot, and the conversations then become useless. So try to go into these conversations where you are Communicating. Mm-hmm. If you lose communicating, it, it, it's it's a moot point. The conversation is use, useless, and you didn't make you you didn't solve the problem. You only created another one and added another layer of muck on top of the problem, <laughs> which makes it harder to uh, unbury that, get rid of that dirt and that muck to go back to the the core of the issue. So try to get to the core as quick as you can and see what's really going on and where the problem began. And uh, Because typically what I've found in all relationships as things start, as mud starts slinging, it's really about not the problem. The problem was something totally different. You know, five degrees, 15, 20, 50 degrees off the other side and everyone's just picking on over here and they've never really get down to the core of what the problem was. And once you get to the core, you really can't unsolve and unwind that that awful hornet's nest that you guys have spun. 
Mm -hmm. Well, that's all I have for you on the parents and parenting edition. Okay. Well, that was a fun one to go through. <laughs> let's uh, let's stay away from that one for <laughs> going forward. It's tough. They're very tough They're questions. Tough. They are, and you know, you try to be very general, but and I and I do say one thing: if people are going to write in, please try to give us everything as much as you can think on facts that that someone would ask because we really try to to get to what your issue is and sometimes I don't have enough knowledge to really know all the facts and you guys don't see this but sometimes I'll say to Morgan off you know it's off camera I don't have enough facts and it's hard and I and I'm trying to be as accurate as I can in my mind to process this stuff so the more facts that we get uh, the 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 better the solutions or the the recommendations that we can talk about and and the possibilities. For sure. Uh, that being said, if you would like to write in, the forms are open. So you go to the description on the YouTube video, and you'll see a link to the Google Forms there. Or if you follow Father Knows Something on Instagram, it'll be linked in the bio as well. And that is how you get. You're right in to Jerry. And Lauren W., I know you're asking for this, so I'm looking for yours. <laughs> Maybe it's already there. It might be. Well, we'll if, you see, if you see Lauren W., I, 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 I want to look. Okay. Well, sign us off. Well, that's it for another week of uh, a Father Knows oh, Something. That's right. And uh, we look forward to seeing you next week. And... Keep writing in. Thanks. Have a great evening and a good week.